By that I mean he was 100% man. And as God, it was impossible for him to sin. However, he was genuinely tempted, even though as God, it was impossible for, for him to sin. So the question I want to try to answer tonight is how can that be true? How could it be impossible for Jesus to sin and yet be genuinely tempted? The, sinle the, the sinlessness of the person of Jesus did not make his temptations to sin inauthentic, did not make his struggle against temptation to sin disingenuous. Jesus resisted temptation. The Bible's clear about that. And Jesus always obeyed his heavenly father. But guess what? He didn't do that by relying upon his divine nature. He did that through the same resources provided to him in his humanity that are provided to you and me. And I want to try to prove that and, and uh, share this with you tonight. I want to have a word of prayer, and then I want to talk about Christ resisting temptation, and then about us resisting temptation. All right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for this time together. Thank you that despite all of the, the things that have uh, uh, taken place to try to just drown out this time, and uh, to hinder. We thank you, Lord, that you have overruled. And here we are. And Lord, you have something that you want to say to us from your word tonight. And we want to hear. And we want to take it to heart. And we want to apply it in our lives, even when we're taken by surprise. So, Lord, thank you for the truths that you have for us here in the scripture. We give you the praise and we, we just marvel, we marvel, Lord, at uh, your person and uh, your humanity, your manhood. Uh, what a man, uh, as we study this out and we see your life, we're, we're just amazed. And we just pray tonight that we'd be encouraged as well, that we would see that you did not live this sinless life uh, by depending upon your godhood, but by depending upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your human life, just like we can. Well, Lord, I pray that this would become clear in Jesus' name. That is for your glory, your sake. Amen. So let's talk about his resistance. When I, I mean the Lord. Remember the verse in the book, the book of Hebrews? The writer of Hebrews says this. That we don't have a high, Jesus is our high priest, right? But he says, we don't have a high priest that is not touched by the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses, but that he was in all points tempted like as we are. Now, think about that for a moment. Think about the way in which you are tempted to sin. I mean, nasty stuff too, right? Tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Though he's tempted, he's sinless. He's innocent. He, the most important truth about the Lord is that he is absolutely innocent his whole human earthly life. Jesus never sinned. In fact, even on the cross, you remember the thief that turned to him and uh, rebuked the other thief and said, you know, this man has done nothing unjust or unjust. We are guilty, but he's not guilty. You remember how Paul presents Jesus as the one that was our substitute? He said he took our sins in his body on that tree, but he said, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He knew no sin. He was sinless. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 says something to this effect that for that he was manifest uh, in this world. He, he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 
John tells us. And so Jesus is the absolute innocent human being. You know, before sin entered the human race, before Adam and Eve disobeyed God's one command, they lived in a state of what we would call innocence. And Jesus maintained that state of innocence throughout his whole earthly life as a human being. And then I, I wanted to introduce a word to you that theologians use that perhaps you're not too familiar with. It is the word impeccable. Not only was Jesus innocent, but he was what theologians call impeccable. Impeccability is faultlessness, and in the area of theology, it means if someone is impeccable, if Jesus is impeccable, he's the only one that is, it means he is not liable to sin, okay? He's impeccable. Jesus' human nature is rendered incapable of sinning because his human nature is united with his divine nature, okay? From that standpoint, it is absolutely impossible for Jesus to, to sin because he's not merely a human being. He's 100% human, but he's 100% God, and those two natures, divine and human, are joined together in the person of Christ. So he's impeccable. His human nature is rendered incapable of sinning because his human nature is forever joined and united to his impeccable divine nature. All right? Let me throw a third thing out that I want you to consider, and that's this that I would call irrelevant. The fact that Jesus is impeccable is irrelevant in explaining his sinlessness. Here's what I mean by that. His impeccable divine nature has nothing directly to do with how Jesus was able to resist temptation and to remain sinless throughout his whole life. If it did, we'd have no encouragement for resisting temptation tonight. So you follow what I've said thus far? He's innocent. He's impeccable, incapable of, of, of sin because his human nature is joined to his divine nature. But that's not the way, that's not the reason why he remains sinless on this earth. That's irrelevant. Let me illustrate it this way as best as I can. This isn't an original uh, illustration uh, from me. but. Uh, to distinguish between why Jesus couldn't sin and why he didn't sin. There's a difference. To distinguish between why Jesus couldn't sin and yet didn't sin. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that there was a, a world champion swimmer, and he wanted to break the world's record as far as miles that he could swim. And uh, let's just say that the world record was 70 miles. And so he had to break the record by swimming 70 miles. And so he would train, he would work, and he would find that when he would maybe swim 30 or 40 miles, he would be totally exhausted and his muscles would begin to cramp up. And so as he expressed this, he was advised perhaps to have a boat that would follow him a, a distance away that would follow him that just in case uh, his muscles would cramp and he couldn't make it, the boat could rescue him and he wouldn't drown. The day came and uh, the boat was following him. But he was able, because of his training, he was able to push through and break the record. Now, two things. That swimmer couldn't drown. Why? 
because the boat was following him. If he, if he needed it to be rescued, he would be rescued. Secondly, he didn't drown because he kept on swimming. He didn't stop. That illustrates as best as I know how that Jesus, he couldn't sin because he had a divine nature that would keep him from drowning, so to speak. But he didn't sin because he kept resisting the temptation through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in his earthly life. Are you with me so far? I know this is kind of, it's, it's uh, working out the, the brain, right? It's, you got to think with me on this. So that's Christ's temptation in the resistance category. Now I want to talk about the resources, okay? I want to talk about the resources that Jesus used to keep from drowning, so to speak, to keep from, uh, from sinning. What were the resources that he used? Well, listen to these verses. I, I'm just going to read them. You don't have to turn here, but just, just listen to them. This is Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Here he is in his childhood. It says, and the child grew. He waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Well, guess what? Those same characteristics are spoken of other people. They're spoken of uh, people in the book of Acts that are filled with wisdom, that have the grace of God upon them, that are strong in spirit. So this is, this is not talking about his divine nature. This is talking about his human nature and how he is growing in his human nature spiritually. Now listen to this same chapter. This is after he is, uh, he disappears in the temple when he's a 12 year old boy and his parents can't find him. They find him. And it says in, in, uh, verse 52 that Jesus went home with them and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. You see, he had to grow into it like any human being. That's what, that's what's taking place here. And then also, uh, I'll share uh, some verses in a moment from the fourth chapter of Luke. But what I'm trying to say is, how did Jesus resist temptation? What resources did he use? He utilized all the resources that were given to him and that are given to you and to me. And one of the, one of the clearest ones is he was a, a, from a young man, to his adulthood, he was a man that was saturated. What do you mean by that? He was a man that was saturated with the word of God. Jesus, from his young childhood, from his boyhood, he loved the Bible. He loved the word of God. He would be the epitome of Psalm 1. The man that delights in the law of the Lord and meditates in it day and night. How did Jesus resist temptation and not sin? Because he was saturated. He was trusting in the wisdom and the rightness of his father's will as found in the word of God in the Bible. But not only was he saturated, here's another resource that he used. He was connected. And by that, I mean, he often would leave the 12 and he would go off by himself to connect with his father in a special time of prayer. He was connected through a vital prayer life with his heavenly father. I remember, I think it's in Mark's gospel, the first chapter, he has a extremely busy Chock full, packed ministry day, well into the late hours of the night. And then you read the next morning, he rose early before dawn, before light, and he goes off to a secret place to be alone so he could pray to his heavenly father. Well, I'm telling you, we're, we're seeing the resources that he was able to resist sin through. 
He's saturated. He's connected. But also, thirdly, he is he, he's depending. He depended. He lived a life in which he was relying upon the Holy Spirit to enable him, to empower him, to resist temptation in order to obey his Father's will. He was depending upon the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen him to accomplish all that God wanted him to do. I say that to say this. That's our resources. To be saturated, to be connected, and to be sure that uh, we have depended upon the Lord, on our, our, the Holy Spirit. Now, the reality is this. Though Jesus is God, his temptations were real. And he fought those temptations as a spirit-filled man. And did you know if you're a believer, you could be a spirit-filled person. And you can fight temptations with the same resources that Jesus utilized. And I just want to uh, share with you the fierceness in which he fought the temptations to sin. For instance, I I said I'd share some more verses in Luke. Luke chapter 4, this is uh, the, uh, the time when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Now, don't think that just because this is the only temptation recorded in Scripture, that that's the only time that the devil bothered tempting him to sin. His whole life was intense temptation more than you and I ever experienced. And here in this uh, fourth chapter of Luke, the devil comes to him and uh, he takes him up to a high mountain. He, the devil shows him, it says, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, that's a supernatural thing. I understand that. But the devil is, 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 a, is a supernatural being too. And the devil said to him, all this power I will give you and the glory of them because it's delivered to me, and it's mine to give to whomsoever I will. But all you have to do is worship me, and it'll all be yours, Jesus. Now, Satan had the right, and he he says it here, to offer this because he's the prince of the world. He's the god of this world. So he he, he, he has that ability. But if Christ would have accepted course, he would have bypassed the cross. He would have bypassed suffering, the crucifixion, and would have all have been lost. And so Jesus not only, uh, Jesus is tempted fiercely, but he's not tempted like we are. He's not tempted through a fallen nature, but he is facing the most difficult barrage of temptation that anyone ever has faced. I'm convinced of that because of who he was and the the focus that the evil one had upon him. Satan realized that that Jesus had to be destroyed in order to protect his kingdom, in order to protect his domain. And so Satan was willing to do whatever it took just to get Jesus to sin just one time. All Jesus had to do was sin one time, and it was over. And so Satan fiercely tempted him. Now, Jesus fought relentlessly. He he fought totally and thoroughly, defeating each temptation that was given him. And that's a wonderful thing. We can rest in that. But let's now, in closing, apply this to ourselves. That is Christ's temptation resisted. Let's talk about the Christian's temptation resisted. I mean, what difference does it make that Jesus lived his life as you, fighting temptation as a human and not as God? Well, it makes a huge difference. Perhaps you thought that's how he remained sinless throughout his earthly life. Oh, he's God. Oh, yeah. Not at all. And that's no encouragement if he did it by relying upon his deity. But he didn't. 
He was relying upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit in his humanity as a human being, just like you and I can. So let's make that application. That gives me tremendous encouragement as a believer. Because this Jesus that totally and thoroughly defeated each temptation, he lives in me. He lives in you if you're a believer. And you can share his victory. You can share that same victory that he experienced all 33 years of his life. Jesus' life is in you if you're a Christian. And when you look to Jesus, you have hope. It's only when I don't look to Jesus, I don't have hope in temptation. Sometimes it comes on us so quickly, and it's over in an instant. <laughs> we, Whoa, what happened? Well, uh, you just blew it. That's what happened. But we don't have to. And the encouragement is that there is the same enablement that the Holy Spirit provided Jesus is provided to you and I. The same resources are available to you and me. Let's talk about it for a moment. We can be saturated. We can be saturated with the word of God. And I'm telling you, until your life could get, you can honestly say that my heart and my life is saturated with the word of God. I don't believe that you or I or any believer will ever be very successful in resisting temptation until our lives are saturated with the word of God. I've never met a Christian having spiritual problems or what you would call a wanderer or backslider that was saturated with the word of God. They all backed away from it. They don't crack the book. They hardly ever look at it. Well, how do you expect to resist temptation? Jesus was saturated with the Bible, and you and I have to saturate our lives. You know what they do with, with the drunks and drug addicts when they put them in a Christian rehab? They saturate them with Scripture. Instead of being under the influence of drugs and alcohol, they're under an influence of the Word of God. They just dunk them. They make them memorize chapters. They make them read and study and, and write out their thoughts. They saturate them with the Scripture. That's a vital key to resisting temptation to sin any kind. So if you're neglecting the Word of God, then you're not serious about getting victory over your sin. I'm sorry, but that's just as plain as I can put it. Secondly, remember, Jesus was connected. He prayed. He was a man of prayer. Are you a person of prayer? If your prayer life is spotty, if your prayer life is weak, anemic, if you pray little, you're going to sin much. That's the way it is. Because prayer is the thing that connects your heart with the heart of God. And when your heart and God's heart are connected, you don't want to do what you would normally do. You want to please him. You want to honor him. And the, and the reason that people don't pray sometimes is because they are so overcome with guilt because of their sin. They don't want to face them. Prayer is the connection that is a key to resisting temptation to sin. Saturated, connected, and remember, he depended. That is, he trusted the Holy Spirit's power. You remember when Jesus at uh, in the garden when he was betrayed, remember he was so overcome with uh, the weight that was upon him. He, was, he said his soul was so sorrowful, like, unto death. And he fell, and he prayed, and he came back to check on uh, uh, Peter, James, and John, and he finds them asleep. Okay, they're tired. I understand that. But Jesus doesn't put up with it. You know what he says to them in Matthew 26, 41? He says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Watch 
it's actually in a command tense. He commands them to wake up. That's what he meant by watch. Get up, it would be another way of, of putting it. And then he says, watch ye. And that's a plural tense that he's using there. He's referring not just to Peter, not just to James. He's referring to all, including you and I. Wake up. It's a command. All of you, wake up. And he says, pray that you enter not into temptation. Pray. Wake up and pray that you enter not into temptation. Connect with God about your sinful tendencies and your sinful desires because of your human weakness. He says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, that's why you need to pray. That's why you need to connect with God because you're weak, your human weakness. You have to depend upon the spirit, uh, the power <laughs> of God's spirit the spiritual power that God himself can give you. That's why you pray. And that's why you depend. And that's how you depend upon the Lord. So that's an encouragement because Jesus defeated temptation to sin the same way we do. We can have the same enablement, which leads me to my last and final thought. What amazement. That gives me amazement that Jesus fervently and successfully fought to defeat each temptation deserves our deepest expression of thanks and praise to him. I mean, what a man with a capital M. What an example with a capital E. What a savior we have. And that same spiritual ability is yours because Christ is in you, because Christ lives in you. When I was a child, I remember, uh, I don't know why, certain things just, there was a, a, a little Scotsman that was an evangelist that my dad had in the church. His name was Alex Dunlap, just a, a short guy, but boy, he was a fireball. He was really on fire for the Lord. And, <laughs> and he wrote a little chorus, and it was called Christ for Me. Simple chorus. Christ for me. Yes, it's Christ for me every day. Uh, um, every day as I go my way, it is Christ for me. Well, I, I would change the word for to through. This is enablement. Christ through me. Yes, it's Christ through me. Every day as I go my way, it is Christ through me. That's it. 